These are 10 of the most common questions that people ask regarding commercial real estate. A lot of this stuff we've covered. A lot of this stuff was general, but I'm putting a little spin on it because I want, I'm going to read you the question as it is. Okay. Then I'm going to rephrase it as if it's a third grader asking the question. Okay. And I want you to answer it like I'm a third grader. Okay. Okay. So how's this different than what we've been doing for 30 plus episodes? <laughs> Here's how it's different. It's like Donald Trump, for example. He talks in a way that a third grader could understand, right? He's not like the politicians that use big words that go over your head. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a huge part, one of the many things of why he's such a uh, Ign 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 enigma? Enigma. Yeah. Yes, an that enigma. A good That's a good one. Ziggy, so. what does enigma mean? A puzzling or inexplicable occurrence or situation. Thanks. So, yeah, Donald Trump becoming president would definitely be enigmatic. Yes. Inexplicable. Yes. Yeah. yeah. This is a field, as you know, that's just full of inside lingo. Yep. I thought it'd be fun to ask you a few of these questions and we answer them as simple as possible. And I've got 10 questions. All right. Well, let's hear them. The first one is, what is commercial real estate? Or asked as a third grader, what are big buildings for business called? <laughs> Which would be commercial real estate? Commercial real estate. You kind of already answered it, but. Right. So I went and spoke with Maddie's class on career day. When she was in elementary school huh. and I went in there and I told her <laughs> in her class that I was a commercial real estate broker. Does anybody know what that means? And you know what they thought I did? Yeah. They thought I was you. They thought I was in commercials oh. that they saw on TV. Right. And I was like, nope, I work with people who are trying to use, buy, sell big buildings that aren't houses. Mm -hmm. And that's really what commercial real estate is. It's property land, buildings that aren't houses. Meaning people live in houses. Mm -hmm. With these buildings, people don't live in them. No, they use them to conduct business and to make a profit. And so I described to her class the different types of buildings. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know what a retail property is? And they're all like, no. If you go shopping with your mama, where do you go? At Target, Walmart, the mall, blah. That's retail. That's where you go to buy stuff. Mm -hmm. Retail. Right. Like, what are office properties? And that one they kind of got. It's Right. It might be where mommy or daddy goes to work. Right. You know, they're they're conducting their business, and that's generally an office space. And it's right. Like, well, what about industrial? You know, blank spaces. But, but yeah. It's like, have you all seen those big, like, they're big rectangles, and they're metal, and they're ugly. Have you all seen those? And they're like, yeah. It's like, that's industrial. Mm. Warehouses, factories, you know, distribution. Of course, I didn't say distribution. Right, right, right. Where people, you know, where companies like move stuff around, you know, mm -hmm. that's an industrial property. And I was like, how many of you live in apartments? You know, a few hands went up. And, mm -hmm. Well, apartments are another type of commercial real estate, even though you might think, well, we live there, they're residential. But because mm. they're multifamily, like more than one family lives in a property, those are generally apartments. And that is a part of commercial real estate as well. All right, question number two. All We're right. going to revisit that answer, too, in a second. Here's the question. How does commercial real estate differ from residential real estate? As a third grader would ask, how are big buildings for business different from houses pe where people live? The, the big difference is, are you living in the property or are you going to it for some type of business or profit-making activity? What is profit? Like making money. Making money. Yeah. Okay. So you're either living in it or you're going there to, to make money. It's about that simple. Right. It is. Yeah. It is that simple. <laughs> Question number three. Number three. How do I invest in commercial real estate? Or how can I use my money to get a piece of a big business building? The basic question you're asking here is when you have money, you can do three things with it. Do you know what they are? Mr. Third Buy. Rider. Okay. So you can spend it. You can spend, you can spend it. the money. You can save it, save it, or put it in, put it into something that'll make you more money. Invest. Which is a good third grade version 
of a definition for invest. Yeah. So you can spend it, you can save it, you can invest it. All right, if you spend it, you generally want to get something in return, but then it's gone. And what you get in return generally doesn't have any value beyond the consumption of it. So you like you could spend the money uh, to buy cake. a meal. Oh, yeah. right, yeah. a funnel cake. You get the funnel cake, you enjoy the funnel cake, you ingest the funnel cake, but then it's gone. And so is your money, All right? Mm. So you got something in return, but like the money's gone. You can also- Then it turns to poop. <laughs> <laughs> you could spend $20,000 on a golden lobster or uh, 20 cents on um, um, ramen noodles, and it's all just going to be poop. <laughs> you know, as I was in my head playing out the explanation here, I thought 100% chance- Timmy turns this into something about poop. <laughs> <laughs> I love the thought of how much you spend on a dinner, and no matter what, it all ends up as poop. No matter what it is. Anyway, um, you were saying buy something. Yep. Short term. So spend it. Okay. Yep. Maybe you spend. buy a toy. You play with that toy for a while. You get some enjoyment from it. And then you get tired of it and goes away. And years later, there's really no value to the toy. You're not going right. to resell it or whatever. If you're going to save the money, you take the money out of your use and you put it in a bank, in an account. And, and your idea there is in the future, I may want to use that money for something. Mm. But I'm going to save it to make sure that, you know, depending on what happens in the future, I've got some money set aside where I can handle whatever life throws at me. Mm -hmm. right. I know too. I went to Target with my mom, and we there was this really, really awesome little toy. Um, it's like a cauldron kind of thing. It's really great, but I only have I think four four dollars, and but it was I think more. So mom said I could use my four dollars and put it under my bed, and when I get more money, I could add it to that. And so save up for something you want to buy. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. <laughs> I feel like your mom's a really great person. My mom's really, really great. Yeah. Yeah. World sometimes, <laughs> sometimes she doesn't let me do things I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So spend, save, and then invest. Invest is the idea. I'm going to take my money and I'm going to purchase something with it. I'm going to put my money into something that, where my money will go to work for me and make me more money. So this is a little bit more grown up idea, but if you were to take your money and buy part of a company called stock and that company increases in value, then your little piece of the company that you bought will also increase in value. And so instead of taking $10 and buying a toy or taking $10 and saving it by putting under your mattress, you take $10 and you put it into a company and that company doubles in size. Now your $10 is worth $20. And so you've used your money to make more money. That's investing. So if I have $10 and I buy lemons and make lemonade, and buy a table with $10 and then I could sell lemonade to make more money. Is that what you mean? Yeah. That'd be an example. In, in this case, you're almost creating your own business. Mm -hmm. You've got a lemonade business. Mm -hmm. So you're going to spend some of your money and you're going to buy materials and you're going to create a product, create something that people want and they're going to buy it from you. So on a hot day on the street in the neighborhood, if you're selling lemonade and people are thirsty, then you might be able to spend $10 on a table and some lemons and some cups and stuff, mm -hmm. make lemonade, and you might leave that day with $15. Mm -hmm. So you spent 10 but you end up with 15 mm -hmm. and so you made $5 that day. My, my dad says that's investing in myself. Yes. <laughs> so what was even the question? How can I use my money to get a piece of a big business building? You could get all of your friends and everybody pools or combines, puts together their $10. Uh -huh. And so they end up with $200 uh -huh. and you go buy something that's, that's worth more money. And it, it can, you invest and that $200 that you and your friends have put together 
could make more money for all of you. Mm -hmm. Where where do I go to? Do I just walk up to the building and <laughs> knock on the door? You you'd need to find out who the owner of that building is. Would they want to sell you a piece of it, or oh. you might find somebody that that works in that space mm -hmm. that can say, hey, here's here's your opportunities. You could buy this, this, and this. There are people like me who help, you know, third graders invest in commercial <laughs> real estate property. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. there's different ways to do that. Mm -hmm. And and if you want a more detailed look at that, you can watch this one. That's right. That's right. Because we did. We talked about different ways to invest. Okay, cool. Yeah. You having fun? It's a little bit challenging. It is, yeah. Going Barney style. Uh -huh. we, when I was in the Marine Corps, if our drill instructors were trying to teach us something and the collective group of us in the platoon were struggling with it, you might hear some something like, all right, I'm going to break it down shotgun style for you. Mm. Shotgun style being, it's just very simple. You pop open the shotgun, remove the shells, put new shells in. And very simple. Right. Or they might call it Barney style. Right. Like Barney the dinosaur. Right, right, right. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Shotgun style. Barney style is not always my default this, mode of communication. That's why I'm having so much fun. Mm -hmm. You are such a good teacher that this skill might be a good one to hone mm -hmm. a little more, you know? Uh, well, thank you. And I think you might be right. Yeah. Like, you don't have to condescend to people, but, you know, sometimes it's like... Condescend? You'd be condescending. Yeah. Did I say that right? Is that just a big word? It's a big word. Do you know what that means? <laughs> I do. Okay. Talk down to people as if they're dumb or stupid. Mansplaining would be a form of condescending. <laughs> okay, cool. We've answered this before, but just to get a succinct, here's the question. What's the answer? What are different types of commercial real estate properties? Or what are the different kinds of big business buildings? Big business. Well, one is land, you know, pieces of dirt. Mm -hmm. You buy it, and then you would build one of those big buildings. Yeah. All right. So land is is one of those. Retail properties are one type, and this is where you go to shop. You go to buy stuff. These are stores where they sell things, and you mm -hmm. go there, and you buy them. Is it, or is it mostly goods? Because when I think of retail, I think of, like, clothes. Big clothes. Is the restaurant retail? Restaurant is retail. You know, you think about a strip center, what you might see in there is a dry cleaner. They provide a service. Mm -hmm. That's retail space. Yeah. You might see an urgent care where you go for medical services. It's, that's that's retail. It's medical space, but it's in a retail property. Right. You know. it, it, yeah, no matter what it is, you're getting it. You go there to get the thing mm -hmm. and walk away with it or yeah, with it I inside like you. Or That's probably pretty close yeah. yeah like food yes like food okay. <laughs> now uh, or urgent care you know sure <laughs> core temperature yeah. situation yeah okay so yeah, yeah. office on the other hand you don't generally go to an office to buy something right you go to an office to do work of some kind my office is an office property i mean we're in it right now right mm -hmm. you know people don't come here to buy something specific you know right. the place where people go to work for certain types of businesses are office properties mm -hmm. okay now different than that are industrial properties people go to work there and they often make things where they move things around and mm. they need big spaces to do it generally and these are those big kind of ugly buildings as a consumer you are not going to this place mm. you're going to get stuff from there Business to business, generally. Mm. So, yeah, as a consumer, you, you generally won't go to an office to buy something. You generally won't go to an industrial property to buy something. Right. You're going to go to a retail mm -hmm. store to buy something. You say business to business, but Amazon, most of what they have is industrial mm -hmm. properties. Mm -hmm. And would that be a, B2B, a business to business? When a consumer goes to Amazon, they're treating the Amazon website as if it's a retail store. Mm-hmm. But on the other side, businesses and industrial properties use Amazon uh, as their storefront mm -hmm. to deal directly with consumers. Gotcha. So there is some B2B that goes on there. There are businesses like as a business, 
I'll go to Amazon sometimes and buy, in fact, the cameras that we're using right here. Mm -hmm. I went to Amazon and my business bought these cameras to do this podcast that mm -hmm. technically B2B, mm -hmm. business to business. But yeah. Amazon and e-commerce in general has kind of blurred those lines. So right, right. It's a lot like Costco and Sam's Club. Mm. They brought in, in an industrial property and turned it into a retail storefront. Mm. That's what those places are, these warehouse stores. Right. Consumers go there to buy. Right. So there's there's some blurred lines in there. Yeah. Somewhere, but Sam's or Costco, are you saying, or I guess you're, what you're saying is they're now retail. They're both. Because of the type of building it's in and the way the business runs. And, and I don't know how this is across the country, but in Owensboro, mm -hmm. Lowe's has a light industrial zoning. Oh. The city looks at it as a warehouse. Right. Even though it's also a retail. So ultimately you got four. So you have the four plus land. That's generally the four. And apartments, people inherently get, even third graders. They're places that people live, but they're investment properties because somebody owns those and families rent their space. The definition is anything over four units is a commercial real estate property. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if there's five units, it's commercial real estate. If there's 12 units, if there's 200 units, it's a 400 unit apartment complex. Those are investment properties. They're commercial real estate. Mm -hmm. And investors, people with money, will buy those properties so that their money will earn more money mm -hmm. for the owners. And they do that by taking those spaces and renting them to families who either don't want to buy a house and have a mortgage or can't afford to buy a house. Mm -hmm. And so they'll rent instead. Why is it all of a sudden commercial if there's more than four? That's just where I'm hung up. Like, I understand the, the answer to it, but are there different regulations put in place when it comes to four units as opposed to a six-unit building? There's really no difference other than the title of it. Why that is, I have no idea. Okay. Then I got a follow-up question then. Okay. Okay. Are you okay with all these questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Right. So we did a whole episode on why residential agents – should not go into commercial deals generally. So if I'm a residential agent and now all of a sudden I got this opportunity to work on, you know, a more than four unit apartment building, is that something you would, uh, you would feel comfortable with the residential agent doing that in general? I don't know if feeling comfortable is the right turn of phrase. Might not be. It's a whole different skill set. Mm -hmm. So when you leave, what kind of a down payment do you have? Can you afford the mortgage? Like you're helping people make a good decision on where they're going to live. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily the bottom line and it's not an investment decision. Mm -hmm. Okay. But over here it is, and it's a different skill set in how you advise and how you help your clients make a good decision or pass on a deal. I see. Completely different skill set. So I do think that it's better for you to work in a space where you have the skill set to serve your clients well. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, even though I have the same license as a residential agent, mm -hmm. I could go sell a house if I wanted to. There's nothing preventing anybody on the residential side from coming over and doing commercial real estate. Mm -hmm. What they do is they leave their area of expertise and hope they're advising their clients well. Mm -hmm. On bigger deals generally with more risk and more right. consequence. And right. Like it's just harder for them to serve their clients well. So mm -hmm. that's my biggest hesitation on kind of moving from one side to the gotcha, other. Gotcha, yeah. And it's the same reason, like, I don't even try to sell my own house. When we sell our house, like, I list it with a residential agent because mm -hmm. they really know what they're doing. And that's a, it's a different skill set yeah. that I don't really have. Right. Even though I have the license that will allow me to do it, it's just a bad idea. Yeah. The apartment that we sold in Chicago to move here, which was actually a condo, right? Like you owned condo. it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we owned that space that in space. that multifamily building. Right. So it, that's a, that's different than anything we're talking about in this moment because that's a building full of more than four units, but each unit is owned individually for the most part. So that's all residential. Yep. So that would not be under commercial at all unless you had one buyer buying the whole thing. Which means every owner in that building would have to sell at the same time, basically, to that same person. Right. Not at the same time, but right. to that same person for them to just put it all back together. Right. That makes a lot more sense to me because I'm coming from, oh, well, we own this, but this is, this is considered commercial. 
and what I've stayed. And what I've noticed in the larger markets, like you came from Chicago, you moved mm -hmm. back here. You called your place an apartment. Right. But you owned it. It was actually a condo. It wasn't an apartment. Is that the that's what made it a condo? Mm -hmm. Is because we owned that space. In that building. Ah. Mm -hmm. I don't think I ever knew that. No. The, the difference between a condo and a now, here's another example. We've got under contract uh, that industrial property in Evansville mm -hmm. that our sister owns. Right. Right. We're going to buy it from her. And there is a space at the end of that building that that tenant isn't actually a tenant. They own that little cutout space. Oh, yeah. It's a condo. Oh. It's a office condo. Right. And before I buy the building from Cody, she's going to buy that back from the owner of that little space so right. that I buy the entire building from her and not most of a building. From right, her. right. Yeah. Condominium. Mm -hmm. I've got so many questions for Alexa right now. A little, a little wait. Okay. <laughs> so like, what? what's the root of all that? Here's the next one. All right. How is commercial real estate valued? Or how do we decide how much a big business building is worth or land? Okay. So here's a big word for you that we'll have to try to the first thing you think about is what's the intrinsic value? Okay. Ask your buddy. Ziggy, what's intrinsic mean? The adjective intrinsic is usually defined as belonging to a thing by its very nature. Yeah, so it's just as it is, right? If that thing's just sitting there, what's the thing just worth? Right. So a lot of times we'll communicate that in terms of price per square foot. So if you're going to buy... A 20,000 square foot warehouse mm -hmm. for a million two. Million dollars and a million and two dollars? One million two hundred thousand dollars. Okay. Right. Then the price per square foot would be sixty dollars a square foot. So you're taking a million two and dividing that by, by the 20,000. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So sixty dollars a square foot. And if you look around the that area or the country and you see some of these buildings being sold for $200, $300 a square foot, just by the nature that it exists. Does it make sense that it's worth $60 a square foot? And in fact, it does. $60 a square foot for a warehouse property, it's going to cost me one twenty a foot just to build the thing. Right. So am I comfortable with the intrinsic value being $60 a square foot? And and I am. Mm -hmm. okay. So another another way to look at it is what's the market value so the, a market is where people go to buy and sell things, right? Mm -hmm. So a supermarket, a grocery store, they have stuff you need to buy, you go, and that, that's a grocery store, a supermarket. Mm -hmm. A commercial real estate market in a city is just, it's the city. People are selling things and people are buying things. So the market would be that geographic area. So what's the market value of a property in that space? It's what a buyer and a seller can agree upon the prices. So if... If a seller sells something for a million dollars, the buyer buys it for a million dollars. They've set the market value because in that market, it was sold. It was bought for a million dollars. So that's the market value. Yeah. Right. So I'm going to explain what my understanding of market and just tell me if I'm right or not. Sure. If this would be a good one. I've got something I want to sell. No one's buying it. So the market has said, I'm putting, I'm selling it for too much money. You're, you see what I mean? You're wanting too much money. I'm yes, I'm wanting yep. too much money. Yeah. So the market responds and says, "Not interested." Right. So you're to me, high. that means the market is what the consumer wants to pay for a thing. Okay. Well, let's do that in reverse. Okay. If there are no transactions happening mm -hmm. because sellers are high and buyers are low, mm -hmm. you don't know what the market value is because there's never been agreement on anything and mm -hmm. nothing's actually sold. Yeah. That's a lot of what we're struggling with right now. A lot of sellers still think it's 2021 mm. at the height of values. Right. Buyers are like, the, the world has changed, and so we're willing to pay this. And if the sellers say, no, we're not selling for that, then there's no agreed upon market value. There's no transactions happening. And so price discovery or figuring out what the market value is mm -hmm. is very difficult to figure out if nothing's selling. Right, right. Now think about this. You sold your condo in Chicago. Mm -hmm. You listed it here. Mm -hmm. And what happened? Within a week, yeah. you had competition and the market responded in the same way. And they said, you're asking this, 
but there's a lot of competition. And so you had people offering you more yeah. and you sold it for more than you were asking. Mm -hmm. So the market responded in the same way, except this time they said, no, we're willing to pay more than what you're asking. Right. You agreed to sell for that and mm -hmm. you established the market value at higher than you were asking. So it can go either way. Right, right. But in your case, there actually was a transaction mm -hmm. and market value was established. Right. And it became a comparable sale. Right. That informed everybody else in that market who had similar properties. Mm -hmm. Your deal informed what their property was worth. Right. Now, investment value is a little bit different than market value. Investment value is what's the value of the property worth to you as the investor. Right. So you got a sales price means very little until there's agreed upon buyer who will pay the sales. So like mm -hmm. asking price means very little. Mm -hmm. It's the agreed upon price. But when you consider a deal or you consider buying a house or whatever, you're going to look at that piece of property and you're going to say, okay, it's worth this much to me. That's the investment value of the property for that buyer or mm -hmm. investor. Mm -hmm. And it may or may not be market value. If it is market value, then a deal will happen there. Mm -hmm. So when I looked at Cody's property, mm -hmm. I analyzed it as an investor and I decided the investment value of this property is this amount of money. And it was right there what the asking price was for the building. Mm -hmm. And so when we close that deal, the investment value of that property agrees with her idea of what she wanted to sell it for and we're going to establish market price mm -hmm. when we buy it yeah when we do when we close the transaction yeah got it yep yeah okay cool transaction means deal when we close the and deal. deal means i give you money you give me the thing mm -hmm. the yeah. property right yeah. all right cool yeah, the, the property the building the big business building <laughs> mm -hmm. What are the risks associated with commercial real estate investments? Third grade level, what could go wrong if I put my money into a big business building? Well, let's first ask what could go right. If you put your money, you invest, you put your money in a big building, mm -hmm. and it makes more money for you. Mm -hmm. The risk is it makes less, and you can actually lose that money. Mm -hmm. That's your risk, and it's very possible. Values of properties can go down. You can make a lot of mistakes and the world can change around you with some crazy unanticipated event that you can't control. Like a pandemic is a good example, a recent mm -hmm. example. In 08, 09, there was the you know great recession because of the residential housing bubble and uh, loose lending practices, mm -hmm. helping people buy houses that they really couldn't afford and all that caused a big problem. So... There's things happening outside of your control that affect how a commercial real estate property performs. Mm -hmm. So there's a risk there, and that is you could actually lose your money or you could make less than you planned. And if you borrow money from a bank to help you buy it, you still owe them regardless mm -hmm. of how good or poorly your investment did in the property. So if you borrow money, it adds to your risk because mm. if things go bad, you may not just lose the money you put in, but you still have to pay back the money you borrowed from the bank. Mm -hmm. And depending on what you agreed upon with them, if you can't do that, they might be able to come take your house. Right. So right. It, can be, it can be risky, but it boils down to, I'm going to invest in this property. It's going to make me money or it's going to lose me money. Mm -hmm. and right. That's the, right. That's the risk. Yeah, and if you want to really take a look at how to underwrite one of those properties, which is basically put it down on paper and see if it is going to make you money, mm -hmm. is you click that right there. It's so good. You walk me through underwriting. Okay, great. How do commercial real estate leases work? Or how do you rent a space in a big business building? A lease is a piece of paper that gives you the rules of how you're going to use the property. Mm -hmm. All right, so... If you're leasing space, you're called a tenant. And if you're a tenant that has a lease, that piece of paper with all the rules gives you what's called leasehold rights. It allows you to use that space under certain conditions. Mm -hmm. Normally, it'll have things like, you know, if I'm going to have a, a quilt making business, then the lease will say I can use this space to make quilts. Mm. And that's all. 
Mm. And it gives the rules. And the rules define, okay, how much do I have to pay the person who owns the property or the landlord every month? That's mm -hmm. the rent. What about the expenses? Well, electricity costs, water costs, natural gas costs, you know, trash pickup. Those are called utilities. Mm -hmm. Who pays for those? The mm -hmm. lease will tell you the rules. Who pays for those? Well, what if the roof needs to be replaced? Or what if somebody slips and falls in the parking lot and there's expense there? The lease gives you the rules on who pays for that stuff. Mm -hmm. And and what you do before you move in is you negotiate or you make a deal on all those rules. You mm -hmm. agree on them with the landlord and you both sign that piece of paper. Mm -hmm. And then now you have the right to use that space under those rules for a specific amount of time. And all those details are in the lease. Yeah. So I essentially can talk to, so I wanted, I want to say, I want an office here. I could talk to you cause you own it mm -hmm. and you will give me these, this list of rules and how much I got to pay you. Mm -hmm. And it'll show what you are paying and what I'm responsible for paying mm -hmm. all around and is say, I want the right to slip in the parking lot and it's not in there. I'll talk to you and be like, Hey, do you mind giving me the right to slip in the parking lot? And if I do, you know, you release me of liability. <laughs> <laughs> I pay for it. You pay for it. I pay yeah. for the slip. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Even if I don't hurt myself. I'll pay for it in a bruise or something. Because you couldn't even take a bruise for me. Mm -hmm. No, nope, I couldn't do that. But I could put in the rules, you can't push my bruise. Because you are my big brother. This is true. No poking. No poking my bruises. <laughs> <laughs> no jabbing your abrasions. Yeah. <laughs> or your contusions. That's what I meant to say. No jabbing your contusions. Here we go. <laughs> That's for Brian Crawl. <laughs> no poking my bruises. No jabbing your contusions. <laughs> I knew this was going to be fun. Okay, cool. How can I finance a commercial real estate purchase? How can I get the money to buy a big business building? You get it from somebody else, okay? And that somebody else could be a family member. It could be a group of people. It could be a bank. Mm. It could be... You know, a life insurance company, it can be a quasi-governmental agency, okay? And every time you take money from someone else, they expect it back plus a little bit more. And that little bit more is called interest. And interest is kind of the cost of borrowing. Yeah, it's the cost in borrowing the money. You're going to take that money, you're going to put it over here and invest in this property. And ideally, you make more on your investment than it costs you to borrow the money. Mm. And that's called positive leverage. Mm. But that term leverage, that's all that means. I'm going to borrow money over here. It's going to cost me. i got to pay interest on it. But if I take that money and I put it over here in this investment, it's going to make more mm. than what borrowing it cost me. Yeah. And that's positive leverage. Uh -huh. Negative leverage is it costs me more to borrow than I'm actually making in the investment. Yeah, positive leverage. That's a new one for me. Mm -hmm. Two more. What impacts commercial real estate market trends? Or... What things change how big business buildings are bought and sold? Good question. How do I third grade this answer? Right. Because this, the answer to this in depth would be market cycles. There's also macroeconomic forces. Mm. I don't know how to say that in the third grade way. There are things that happen in the world that you can't control that change things. Mm. For instance, we just talked about interest. Well, interest can be low. It can be high. And the government sets the interest rates that the banks have to pay to borrow the money from the government to lend to people like me. Mm. And so when the central bank, what's called the Federal Reserve, Ugh. yeah, when they raise interest rates, the banks raise interest rates to me. I can't control that. Now, and that would be an example of macro. Macro. Yeah, so micro would be on the smaller scale, smaller level. Macro would be the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Micro, in this case, might be things that are happening locally. Right. So maybe my relationship with my favorite bank, mm -hmm. something happens to that relationship and it changes things. Okay. Right. But if uh, a big new uh, company moves to town and they need to hire a lot of people, which causes population growth, 
Well, people create the need for space, what we would call demand. And if there's more need for space, people are willing to pay more to get it mm. because it's... There's not enough for the amount of people that want it. Yes. Yeah. Great way to put that there. Great style. Yeah, there's not enough for the people who want it. Right. So the people who want it will then need to pay more to make sure they get what they need because mm -hmm. there's not enough to go around. And that's what happened with the selling of our condo. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yep. So that's something that could happen locally where that, that has nothing to do with interest rates. That has nothing to do with a pandemic where the government says you have to stay home. Mm -hmm. You can't go to these retail shops unless they're a necessity like a grocery store or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, there are things that could happen you have no control over. That's more that macroeconomic stuff. Right. I'm interested to see how this Israel Hamas mm -hmm. things play, how this plays out. Heard on the news this morning that President Biden was going to put to put forward like a hundred billion dollar uh, aid package, mm. and I think that would take care of providing aid for Israel and Ukraine. That's a huge amount of money. Mm -hmm. Autumn sitting next to me on the couch this morning. We're watching the news, drinking coffee, talk about that hundred billion. She looks at me and she's like, "Where do we get that kind of money?" Yeah. I'm like, from you and me, baby. Mm. Like, that's our tax dollars. Right. And our government operates at a deficit. So they borrow money from places like China. Yeah. So, like, all that stuff, and don't think for a second I understand how all that works. Those are macroeconomic, those are big picture things, mm -hmm. forces at work that can change things at a local level that I have mm -hmm. no control over. Because of those types of changes, that you can't always anticipate mm -hmm. and you certainly can't control, that creates a lot of the risk for investing in commercial real estate. Right, yeah. Can't control that stuff. That can change things. And then the local stuff can change. Like if we have a developer come in and build 1,000 new apartments in town, mm -hmm. that's adding a bunch of supply. That might actually cause rents to go down mm -hmm. because – Maybe now there's more apartments than there are people who want to rent apartments. Mm -hmm. And so if I own some of those apartments and nobody's living in them, I'll, I might reduce my price to attract people to come live here. Right. So that the rents could go down. Mm -hmm. um, haven't seen that much in my career, rents going down, but certainly possible. Mm -hmm. You know, a developer makes a mistake or five developers make a mistake and each think Owensboro needs 200 more apartments and all five of them build 200 more apartments. And now we needed 200, but we've got an extra thousand. Right. You know, that's right. oversupply. That can cause rents to go down. Right. So there's those kind of things that can change what something's valued at or yeah. what something's worth. Cool. Good answer. Thanks. All right. Last one. How does commercial real estate brokerage work? How do people help others buy or sell big business buildings? Well, the question is not what do I do as a broker, which is help people invest in or use space. Mm -hmm. So if you're a business... And so you have an office over here. You've been killing it. A lot of growth and you're out of space. You need a, a bigger space. You might hire me to help you find that space, to help you negotiate that lease full of rules that mm -hmm. dictates what you can do in that space. Mm -hmm. And we would help you in that process. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or if you own a building, you know, we just listed a building across the street. It's a medical office. The owner, the doctor owner, he wants to sell. And, and retire. He's done. So we're helping find a buyer for him. Mm -hmm. Like That's what we help people do. We help people either solve their commercial real estate problems mm -hmm. or take advantage of the opportunities that they see. Yeah, People only do deals in commercial real estate because they have a problem or they see an opportunity. That's right. it. it. I mean, it boils down to those two things. Yeah. And we, whichever that is, we exist to help them solve those problems or take advantage of those opportunities. Mm -hmm. You're you're essentially a, a middleman that is an expert. Yeah, right? really what we do is we provide that expert information that people need to mm -hmm. make great decisions in commercial real estate because most people just don't have all that information. It's yeah. They don't know what market rents are or what vacancies are, or how much absorption there's I wouldn't know what to look day. for. Like yeah. if I were to go to YouTube or whatever, you know, if I found this podcast, I'd be in the money. It seems like one of the more complex industries. 
Well, I have no idea if that's true. I do know it's more complex than the residential side of things. Mm -hmm. Buying and selling homes, like, don't get me wrong. Like, I wouldn't be good at that because I don't have the expertise that I need to be good at that. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the commercial side of things is more complex than that. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where, you know, that's where we do business. That's what we're good at. I don't know how it would compare to the complexity of uh, rocket science or mm -hmm. uh, brain surgery or I have, I have no idea, but. Well, yeah, sure. When it comes to, you know, any kind of real estate brokerage, it would be more complex than, you know, maybe selling houses. But yeah. I guess now that I think about it, most industries that people aren't a part of, whenever they dabble into it or move into that industry in any way, almost always, you're just surprised at how much you didn't know, mm -hmm. you know? So, and I'm still discovering things I don't know. I'll right. probably, I, I would expect to do that for the rest of my career. Mm -hmm. But look, we're in the information business. And we exist to help people make really good decisions based mm -hmm. on their situations. Like, that's really what we do. Yeah. Uh, so it's our market knowledge. It's our experience. It's knowing, you know, who to talk to and, you know, the network and relationships that we've built. Those are what our clients get the benefit of mm -hmm. when they use us. And so we can generally help them move faster and make better decisions. Mm -hmm. Nothing kills a deal easier than time. Mm. You know, so like speed matters. So if you're if you're a good commercial real estate brokerage, you've got your finger on the pulse of what's happening, especially in that local market. Almost only in that local market. Because mm -hmm. if you came to me like, let's just make an assumption that I'm really good at what I do. Yeah. Okay. Okay. If you drop me in San Antonio, Texas, like I cannot advise someone mm. with the expertise that they need if I'm there. Right. I don't have the information on that market. Right. Now, with 20 years of experience, I could probably get what I needed to be good there fairly quickly. But the yeah, relationships you have here. I don't have there. Yeah, right. Commercial real estate is very, very local. Yeah. And so, like, you wouldn't hire me to help you buy an apartment complex in Southern California. Right. Like, that would make no sense. Mm -hmm. I can't provide that kind of value there. I don't I don't understand that market. Yeah. So you give them Eric Christopher's number. That's right. Yeah. You call our buddy Eric Christopher. Yeah. Yeah. So it is very different than brain surgery. Because if I'm a brain surgeon, doesn't matter if I'm in San Antonio or Owensboro, Kentucky. It's the same. Yeah. It's probably a little bit more nuanced than that. But, mm -hmm. yeah, you could ply your trade pretty much anywhere. Right. Depending on what's going on with the brain. But what I have to offer mm -hmm. is market in information and mm -hmm. expertise in Western Kentucky. Right. We get much further outside of that. Like my expertise goes down real, real fast. Yeah. Yep. So let me ask you this. What's an example of a commercial real estate franchise or something that's national? Sperry Van Ness? Which is called SVN now. SVN. They're, they're a franchise, right? And previously, like in 08, I believe we franchised with them. And right. so our previous version of our company was Baron Enterprises. Yeah. And we franchised with SVN. And so we became an SVN office here. Right. The advantage was I now had friendly offices all over the United States. Mm. And so if you came to me and said, I do want to buy an apartment complex in Southern California, I can help you now by using our office there. Right. And so we're going to we're gonna link up and I'm going to... You've now got teams of people that are experts in their market. I got boots on the ground over there. Yeah. With... I and, see. And... Yeah. Culture of the company, like I understand how they work and I probably know them already and and I can grab a friendly who's an expert there and in conjunction we can serve my client. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. So if Baron Commercial Group were to expand, that means you are oh, – this now I'm saying I'm like, oh, duh. You are building a team of people that are in these markets. Well, look, it's the exact same thing we did to start this podcast is what – if I wanted to open up an office in another – market and expand. I'm looking for the who that I need. Right. When we started this podcast, I was looking for the who, and I reached out to you to help me decide who the who was. Oh, right. I didn't even ask you to be the who. If oh, you right. remember, I was like, hey, will you sit on this call? I'm going to interview yeah. this firm who can, you know, edit the videos and do our social media and stuff. And I said, no, 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 no. Let me sell my place. Move down here. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> no, what you said was, oh, don't do that. 
Right. Like, right. hire me. I can do a better job than that. Right, right, right. Yep. Don't, yeah, don't. Just look. And just, I was like, no, nah, man, you're going to end up on some Netflix show and you're not going to be available or, you know, there's risk in, yeah. in working with family that can go bad and harm right. relationship. All these, you know, I test ideas by poking holes what could go bad. I'm thinking about all that. You you really had to sell me on the. Hey, we do. We do it. We build it. If any of that happens. We'll have people in place or can get people in place. Yeah. Yeah. And, man, so glad. So glad we did. Yeah. We're and this has been great. Episode 30. Dude, this might be 31 or 32 or 33. That's crazy, isn't it? It is. That's I'd like 30, 31 weeks of it. Yeah. That's cool. Dude. Cool. All yeah. right. Well, thank you so much, Bo, for teaching me how to do big commercial will say did you just go uh, Burgess Griffer on me yeah that was more of a three year old than a third grader yeah Burgess Griffer does have a lisp like a little kid um well there's Kevin better take that call better take that call love you brother bye Alice love you too (laughs) bye bye